Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is a beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord, and it's going to be too hot to be outside anyway. But supposedly that changes tomorrow. Yeah. We hope. It is... Um, I want to thank you all from the bottom of my heart for the stole that Carol made and for the gift card that you all gave me. You all uh, paid for Sherry and I to go see the Chicago Cubs play and uh, we had a great time on our vacation and it was just nice to be away for a little bit and just spend time together with my wife. And so thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let us worship our God as we sing together. Christians, we have met to worship, and let's stay seated today. Christians, we have met to worship and adore the living God. Will you pray with all your power while we try to preach the word? All is made unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. Christians, pray. moment shall we it's so good to see everybody here today so today we're going to be talking about the gospel according to the care bears and this is based on first peter 3 8 i'm going to read that verse for you finally all of you have unity of mind sympathy brotherly love a tender heart and a humble mind. So whether you grew up with them or it's your first time meeting them, the Care Bears bring love and good cheer to everyone. Each Care Bear is a different color and has a special belly badge that represents its personality. There's Bedtime Bear, who's your guy when it's time for Betty Bye. Love a lot bear welcomes everyone. Funshine bear is the one who always looks on the sunny side of life. Friend bear makes friends with everyone. Cheer bear is a very happy care bear who helps others see the bright side and that's my favorite care bear. And even grumpy bear who's the resident warrior and helps us understand that occasionally folks can be grumpy. The Care Bears live in a land called Care-a-Lot, and they face all sorts of enemies. Let's watch a little clip of the Care Bears.
weapon that Care Bears have to protect Care a lot and their friends is the Care Bear Stare. As you can see from that clip, the Care Bear Stare is even more powerful when they all work together. I think the Care Bears can teach us a lot about working together and loving our brothers and sisters and even having tender hearts. So let's say a prayer. Hands together in our lap. Heads down. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this day. Thank you for teaching us. Thank you for teaching us. Using cartoons and movies. Using cartoons and movies. How to love one another. How to love one another. Help us to be caring. Help us to be caring. And loving. And loving. With tender hearts. With tender hearts. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, kids, go grab the Father's Day gifts and hand them out to all the guys, okay? You don't have to be a father, you just have to be a man. Or identifying as a man, whatever. <laughs> just just pick, just make sure all the guys get one. What? Let, let Lord I help you. Great. Agreed. Very good. Happy Father's Day. Get him too after you. Okay, Chalice kids, let's go back to the room and make some belly badges. <laughs> Just... <coughs> oh, he's one. <laughs>
prayer. I'm on John's line. Oh God, so often likened to an ideal father, today we are reminded of special fathers and those who fill the role of fathers. And as students of Jesus, we cannot fail to notice that the image of a loving father is often found in his transforming teachings. But Lord, may we have eyes to see and ears to hear the many other ways you are described, O oh God. Wake us when we are slumbering in our complacent ignorance about a rainbow of images in the scriptures which can inform our faith and enlarge it. Meanwhile, on this day of celebration, Father, may we recognize our fathers and other devoted parents who take up the mantle of service to guide, to nurture, and to care for the world's children in a million loving ways. We thank you for them. And may these spiritual qualities rise to the service, surface in all of our lives so that the world may know your love through us to your eternal glory. These things we pray through Jesus our Father in faith as we pray as he taught us, singing together with thanksgiving. from Colossians. Since you are all set apart by God, made holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with a holy way of life. Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Put up with one another. Forgive. Pardon any offenses against one another. As the Lord has pardoned you because you should act in kind. But above all these things, put on love. Love is the perfect tie that binds these together. The word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Testing. Uh -uh. You're on. Right. Okay, uh, before we get started on this there's a part where there's a chorus and the first time I'm gonna you know sing it through but the second time I come through you know everybody is encouraged it's, it's real simple so when you get to it you'll hear it and then you know we'll go the captain of Alpha Centauri. We must be out of our minds. Still we are 
shipmates bound for tomorrow. And everyone here's flying blind. Oh, we must believe in magic. We must believe in the guiding hand. If you believe in magic, you'll have the universe at your command. That is the crew bound. For Alpha Centauri, D dreamers and poets and clowns. Bold is the ship bound for Alpha Centauri. Nothing can turn it around. Oh, we must believe in magic. We must believe in the guiding hand. If you believe in magic, you'll have the universe at your command. at your command. properly sorted. <laughs> A reading from the Gospel of Potter, Book 7, Chapter 4, pages 31 and 32. For those of you not familiar with the canon, at this point, six individuals have been transformed into duplicates of Harry Potter. Fred and George turned to each other and said together, wow, we're identical. They normally are their identical twins. <laughs> I don't know, though. I still think I'm better looking, said Fred, examining his reflection in the kettle. Bah, said Fleur, checking herself in the microwave door. Bill, don't look at me. I'm hideous. I knew Ginny was lying about that tattoo, said Ron, looking down at his bare chest. Harry, your eyesight is really awful, said Hermione as she put on glasses. Here endeth the reading. <laughs> Once upon a time, all good magic stories begin that way. Once upon a time, there was a woman who had envisioned an entire world where love was the most important magic you could have. And she wrote these wonderful stories that are, there are more words in the entire canon of Harry Potter than in the Bible, by quite a lot. Um, so yes, a very prolific wordsmith was Miss Rowling. And she wrote in this story 
some incredibly interesting things that when you take them out and exegete them as we do with scripture, clearly indicate a deep understanding of the many different kinds of oppression we face in the world. She has the oppression of those who are racially different, those who are experientially different, those who are behaviorally different, those who are emotionally different. All of those kinds of oppression are there. In the reading I just gave you, she addresses two different attitudes that trans people experience. One of which is, this is not my body and I'm hideous. And the other of which is, this is not my body and I'm gonna get rid of it. One of them is very pragmatic. One of them is very self-damaging. Self many, many healthy trans people move from one to the other as they go through transition. It's an interesting reality that the author herself doesn't always know what she wrote. Sadly, this is the case with many artists. The art that we make, that we give away, once we give it to the audience, it is no longer ours. The audience decides what they see and what they hear in it. Sometimes we as artists fall so deeply in love, not the healthy kind of love, but the possessive, demanding, and abusive love. We fall so in love with our creation that we refuse to let it live in the world, and we demand that it live only the way we say. It can live only the way I want it to. So one of the things that we learn about love from this is that there is healthy love and there is unhealthy love. It is true in this author's history that she experienced a great deal of unhealthy love. And she is still very, very fearful of that. And that is part of what inspires her current, I can only call it transphobia. I reject the, the label of TERF from Ms. Rowling. TERF stands for Trans Exclusionary Radical Feminist. I think she is definitely trans exclusionary. I'm not sure she's a feminist, I'll give her that, maybe. She's definitely not radical. So at best she's a TEF. <laughs> I think the reason that this, radical feminism is all through these books. Radical feminism is the bizarre notion that love is not gendered is not related to gender, does not express itself based on gender. Love is magic all by itself, lives in the universe as its own thing and inhabits everything. Well, which is it, Miss Rowling? I like the books. I read all seven of them in the last three weeks. I was planning to read them over the next seven weeks, but I got a schedule change. <laughs> And it's a little bit ironic that we are talking about Harry Potter on Father's Day because he lost his father when he was one and then had a succession of father figures, all of whom die. And at the end of the book, the end of the end of the last book, he is himself a father trying to help his sons cope with what if the world doesn't go the way I want? What if I don't fit in? What if I'm not the right kind of person? which is exactly what all of these books are about. The basic magic in these books is the support and love we give to one another as we all face the question of how do I fit? Where do I belong? Who am I gonna be okay with and who's not gonna be okay with me? And is it okay that people are not okay with me? Are there people I can dislike and still deal with? One of the true things that, that is interesting about this book, this one in particular, because when this one came out, four of the movies had already come out. And one of the things that we knew from the previous book is that the great Dumbledore, the great father figure throughout most of these books, first of all has failings, and secondly, apparently was totally wrong about Professor Snape. I mean, we have learned to dislike Professor Snape for six books and, and, and a whole bunch of movies and Dumbledore was wrong. He is not to be trusted. He kills Dumbledore, oh my God. And yet, I myself am an author. I know how to build stories. And I sat there waiting for this book to come out, knowing that that wasn't the truth. There was gonna be something else about Snape. I knew that Snape was actually there because of love. 
Dumbledore would not trust someone who cannot love. He knew Snape could love. He had evidence of that somewhere. I knew that Snape's job was not to protect Harry, but to protect Draco Malfoy, the snotty, bratty, privileged, white privileged, obnoxious, toady, directed, descended from a family of eternal evil, and yet also a child. Snape's job was not to protect Harry. It was to protect Draco, and he did. We find out finally at the end that Dumbledore was dying anyway. He knew it. He had already assigned Snape the job of killing him. Snape wasn't violating anything when he did that. He was, in fact, living up to Dumbledore's promise. End of story. Snape was actually one of the bravest men Harry ever knew. He names his son after him. So the person who is set up throughout the whole thing to be the bad guy, because he's mean, and he's snarky, and he's oppressive, he's, he's got power over these kids and he uses it. We don't like him. He's not supposed to be the good guy. And yet at the end he is. He is a hero because he loves because he is directed first and foremost by love, which does not stop him from being a complete jerk and horse's ass. Love does not stop you from being resentful or mean-spirited or unfair, but love will redeem all of those things in the end. The gospel according to Harry Potter is that without love, nothing can survive and with love, nothing ever really dies. I don't know why it took her so long to say all that. Maybe it was because we had to be convinced that love could truly be magic. Maybe it was that with seven books of people being able to magically open doors and magically repair glasses and magically regrow bones, at the end of the day, the thing that really matters most is that we love each other. All the funny powers in the world and all the flashy costumes and all the tap dancing and sparkles and jazz hands in the world don't amount to much without love. We carefully avoided the Corinthians chapter because it says that all for me and there would be no point in the sermon at that point. So, you know, <laughs> you try not to let yourself be upstaged by the Gospels, but it's hard. The bottom line is that what Harry Potter teaches us is that it's not good versus evil that matters. It's not about being virtuous and perfect versus being mean and nasty and having too much ambition. It's about caring for people versus being empty inside. And the truth about the great bad guy in Harry Potter is that he has over the years so destructively emptied himself that at the end he is totally empty, and all that, all that has to happen is that the vessel is shattered. Once the vessel is shattered, everything is gone. But Harry, who dies, what, he's, he's had the killing curse thrown at him, I think, three times by the, well, no, several times, but it's hit him actually twice. The, the curse that absolutely kills has hit him twice, and he survived it, both times. What makes him so special? The first time, his mother sacrificed herself for him, and that creates a, a, a relation, a, 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 an aura of love, of belovedness around him that the evil of Voldemort can't pierce. But also it's because this horribly evil creature accidentally put part of himself, empties himself into this child and can't self-destruct unless he totally self-destructs. So giving yourself to someone else is another way of staying alive forever. And that's another message in these books. What makes you live forever is what you give to other people. Well, J.K. Rowling has given us some beautiful things in these books. For one thing, she has given us an understanding that you can be transformed into these two women who, who say these things are transformed into a male body with testicles and a penis, and then one of them says, oh my God, I'm hideous, and the other one says, well, this isn't really me, this is you. And boy, do you have bad eyesight. Um, so there's the very practical response to, this is not my body, and there's the very 
personal response of, ew, I don't look like me, and this is icky. Um, but she's given us that understanding in here, even though she does not seem to have held on to it herself. That is a sad thing for her. She is very, very frightened of predatory men. And she has, um, the, the peculiar thing about, about Rowling is that having been part of a predatory relationship, having been part of an abusive marriage, having been part of all these things, she seems to believe that predatory men will go up to a government office, identify themselves, give their address, their, their personal information to the government in order to get a card that says, I'm really a trans woman and I can use women's bathrooms. I can't imagine the kind of predatory man she's talking about ever wanting to identify as a woman. I can't imagine any predator walking up to the government and saying, hi, give me a permit to be a predator. So she's clearly operating from a place of illogical panic. And so I think, therefore, the best gospel from Harry Potter that I take is that it is necessary to pray for and give a great deal of love to the very damaged soul that is J.K. Rowling. But it is not necessary to support her crap. <laughs> when she's saying the crappy things, almost every single actor in all the movies has disavowed what she said. Although they say, we love Jo, she's a lovely person, but we don't agree with this. This has taught us that you can love people who are despicable. That doesn't mean, no, does not mean you have to like them. It doesn't mean you have to sit with them. It doesn't mean you have to agree with them but it is still possible to love them. It is possible to love everyone. Amen. Amen. If you would like, we'd like to invite you to sing along to this. Carol? Miss Carol? I thought you might like to see before I change. I wound up not using them. Yes. Wonder if we're supposed to 
here at this table of love. We come here to lay it all down so that Christ can lift us up. Sometimes loving people is hard. Very, very hard. We all have people in our lives that we struggle with. And sometimes it's the closest family. And sometimes it's good friends that have just gotten on our last nerve. And yet we know that we can love. And we can find a way through things through love. So as we come to the table and remember, bread broken and cup poured. Let us remember that that is our call to love. Let us pray. God of grace and God of glory in this bread and in this cup, be present in us that we might share your love with this world. In Christ's name, amen. As we take the bread and drink the cup. I invite you to spend a little bit of time in prayer. Light a candle. Think about the relationships that you need to work on, that you need to spend time mending with God's love. come to a time of invitation, we're going to sing a song, I'm going to live so God can use me. Let us find ways this week for God to use us, use us in a positive way to share God's love in this world. Find a way that we can come together as a people of faith. This week, the Pride Parade will be happening on Saturday. I know that it starts at 10. The last email we got said, we'll have the order and information for where we're supposed to meet to you by Monday. So we will be sending out some emails and or for those of you that don't do email, we will be calling you and letting you know what we're going to be doing. So I hope that many of you can wear your new shirts and join us for the parade. Let us sing. I'm going to live so God can use me. <laughs> We're going to wake up, right? Get up. <laughs> I'm going to live so God can use me. So oh.
this place and let us share God's love with our world. Offerings can be placed in the baskets in the back of the room. You can send them to the P.O. Box. You can go online and give through Givelify. You can call your bank and have them do it for you. All of that works. Let us share God's love. Amen. <laughs>